In the autumn of 1492, the Taino Indians in the Caribbean were living as they had for hundreds of years. By day, they fished in the sea and tended their gardens. In the lengthening evenings, they gathered to talk and tell stories. They wondered how bad the coming rainy season would be. They could not know that their lives were about to be changed forever by sailors from 3,000 miles away. On October 12, 1492, three ships from Spain wandered into the Caribbean while looking for a route to India. Every student knows what happened next, or do they? Was Columbus really a kindly discoverer bringing civilization to a new world? What were his personal motives for the voyage? And what events did that first encounter between Americans and Europeans set in motion? This program looks at the myths and realities of that momentous October and how they affect us today. For generations, Columbus has been presented as a hero in American classrooms. It was probably first grade or kindergarten, and we are um, talk it was probably around Thanksgiving, and we started talking about him, and um, we learned the little 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, and um, we heard that he was this cool guy, and everybody thought he was crazy, but he was really, he really showed them who was boss because he uh, went around the world. He said the world's round, everybody said, no, the world's flat, idiot, and he said, no, it's not. I was in Montessori school, so it was just before kindergarten, and they were telling us that um, Christopher Columbus was the discoverer of America, sailed from Spain and all the way around, got to America, and he thought it was India. Huh. Um, I just, I, I don't know how you guys learned all that in kindergarten, first grade. All I knew was that the pilgrims, they were pilgrims, and they came and saved the Indians because they gave them food, and, you know, <laughs> later, and then I learned, I don't, I know this is wrong, but I learned that they gave us land. I mean, I know that's totally the opposite of what happened, but that's what I learned, that we gave them food and we were so wonderful. And Many schools still teach the Columbus story as it's been taught for generations now. But what did Columbus really do? And what were the consequences of his voyages? Myths about Columbus have existed for centuries. Little is actually known about him, not even what he looked like. So societies have always been free to invent their heroic visions of Columbus. In the early days of the Republic, 1792, he was thought of as a potential patron saint. The country was almost named the United States of Columbia, as you perhaps know. They settled for the District of Columbia around the capital. Uh, but uh, Columbia, gem of the ocean, the whole notion that this is a country which is somehow new and is best named Columbia. So it, that was the, in 1792. In 1892, the notion that uh, the spread of civilization, that what the white man had done to improve the savage life of the Indians was the great theme. Columbus was celebrated in 1892 as a conquering hero, which reflected the country's expansionistic mood. At the turn of the century, America became an imperial power. We invaded some countries, Nicaragua, for example, and installed governments friendly to American interests. Other countries became our colonies overnight, the largest being the Philippines. In 1934, Franklin Roosevelt made Columbus Day a national holiday after intensive lobbying by Italian-American groups. But not everyone believes Columbus is a hero. Okay, I want you to watch very carefully now. Bill Bigelow, a teacher at Jefferson High School in Portland, Oregon, presents a different version. Thank you. This is my purse. What's that? Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And Dan, that's where you and I disagree, because this is my purse, and I'm going to prove it to you. Because this is my little book. You shouldn't. Who said that? <laughs> you shouldn't what? You know something? This book has been with me for years and years. <laughs> yes? No, really? In fact, I can prove it. I call this, 
I call this book Oscar. <laughs> I named it after my cat. I get, I, I get the feeling. I get the feeling that you don't think this is my purse. Do I read you correctly? But wait. Let's put a little bit different, little bit different spin on it. I didn't steal no maker's purse, Ethan. <laughs> no, 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 no. I discovered this purse. <laughs> I discovered this purse. So now, Ethan, I have recast the act of a purse acquisition. Now I have discovered this purse. And you agree with me, correct? Well, anyone can claim an object. Oh. Anyone can claim an object. I discovered it. Amanda. You, you didn't discover it. You can't say discovered it. It doesn't work. Stole, took. Oh, wait, oh, 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 we have a, a, a veritable thesaurus in our midst here. But now let's look at what Columbus did, after all. I mean, there were people here. Am, am I correct? Correct. OK. OK, Indians. Let's, let's keep comparing it to the purse. They had stuff in the lands that Columbus discovered, correct? If you were just as, as if you were to give me a test on the contents of Nomika's purse, you would give Nomika a test on the contents of the purse. <coughs> Nomika would do better. <laughs> Who would have done better on such a test of uh, stuff that was? The Indians, the, Indians, the Native Indians. Americans. Uh, whoever. Just Why do you think that, Nomika? Because they were there first, and um, they discovered it, and they wouldn't know because uh, they, <laughs> they probably observed it. it. Yeah. OK. <laughs> OK, so we established that. And yet, we still call it discovery. But not we necessarily, but some people, certainly most <coughs> textbooks call it discovery. Well, if you're sitting in Europe and uh, looking at the Western Ocean and someone comes back with news that there's something on the other side that we didn't know about, that is a discovery. So that the word discovering of America puts you on the European side of the ocean. Obviously, from the point of view of people living in the, United St in, in the New World, uh, they were they, they, it was a discovery for them, too, but the discovery was of these ships coming from nowhere and abutting upon their land, hitting, striking their land, coming to their land. Uh, so it, there is a sense in which I think discovery is perfectly legitimate, certainly legitimate from Europe's side. And from the American Indian side, it was a discovery of new kinds of men and new risks and new dangers and new uh, realities that they ne then had to cope with. Discovery is, is simply inaccurate. I mean, if you come to some place where there's already people, you can claim, well, we discovered those people because we didn't know them before, but that's not what you really mean by that word. I mean, the word means discovered, you know, uncovered, found it for the first time in human experience. And of course, if there were already humans there, then it's not the first time in, in, uh, in human experience. So therefore, really, Columbus didn't discover Indians. He encountered them. and. Uh, that seems to me to place the Indians in a more legitimate place in history. When Columbus reached the Caribbean, his first landfall was in the Bahamas. He later sailed on to Hispaniola, now known as Haiti and the Dominican Republic, and established a fort. The Indians that Columbus encountered there were called Taino, meaning good or noble. The Tainos lived in harmony with themselves and their environment a lush tropical Eden such as few Spaniards had ever seen. Land was owned communally, with work shared equally between men and women. Columbus encountered the Caribbean Indians as he was searching for a westward water route to India and China, countries Spain had been trading with for decades. Columbus's voyage was actually a commercial expedition to find gold and spices. Columbus hoped to become rich by obtaining a 10% cut for himself and all his heirs of everything shipped back to Spain via the Western route. He also demanded to be proclaimed governor of any new lands he found. He vowed to convert any people he encountered to Christianity, even if they already had religions of their own. The first meeting between Columbus and the Dainos was friendly. In his diary, he wrote, they are very gentle and without knowledge of what is evil, nor do they murder or steal. They do not bear arms and do not know them, for I showed them a sword. They took it by the edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. 
With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. I believe they could easily be made Christians, for they appear to have no idols. God willing, when I make my departure, I will bring half a dozen back to their majesties, so they can learn to speak. Columbus kidnapped six Tainos and brought them back to Spain to learn Spanish so they could act as translators. He returned one year later with 17 ships and began a brutal and relentless search for gold. On Hispaniola, Columbus ordered every man and woman over the age of 14 to bring him a quota of gold dust every three months. If they failed, the Spanish punished the Indians by cutting off their hands and letting them bleed to death. Indians who tried to flee were hunted down with vicious dogs and torn to pieces. Because there was actually very little gold on the island, many Indians lost their lives. Columbus also tried, unsuccessfully, to establish a Taino slave trade. 500 men, women, and children were rounded up and shipped to Spain. Half died en route, and the rest died in Spain, unable to adapt to the Spanish climate. Gold mining and slavery were not profitable in Hispaniola, but colonization was. Indian land was seized by the Spanish to establish estates called encomiendas. The Indians became their legal property as slaves, were worked unmercifully, and died by the thousands. These slave plantations were later adopted throughout Central and South America, setting a pattern of land ownership that persists to this day. Spanish conquest also brought another adversary. The Spanish introduced deadly new diseases like measles and smallpox. The Indians had no resistance and died by the thousands. When the Caribbean Indians understood the real goals of the Spanish, they began to resist bravely. But spears were no match for muskets. This sad history was recorded at the time by a Spanish priest, Bartolomé de las Casas. The Spaniards made bets as to who would slit a man in two or cut off his head at one blow. For more formal retribution, they would hang chosen Tainos from a gallows frame, just high enough for their feet to nearly touch the ground. And by thirteens, in honor and reverence for our Redeemer and the Twelve Apostles, they put wood underneath and, with fire, they burned the Indians alive. The eventual toll of life was frightening. In less than 100 years, one million Tainos in Hispaniola were reduced to just a few thousand. This pattern of conquest was repeated throughout the Caribbean and all the Americas. What Columbus did to the Tainos, Pizarro did to the Incas of Peru and Cortes to the Aztecs of Mexico. Some people have said that this so-called discovery deserves another name, genocide. The, the conquest of the Americas was a disaster of enormous proportions to the Indians. Um, one has to say unprecedented proportions. It diminished their populations. Uh, to what extent, we don't know, but we know uh, dramatically diminished their, their uh, populations. It, reduced their ability to maintain their cultures and their civilizations. It was, in fact, uh, as though a meteor had struck, had struck their land and had destroyed practically everything, their history, their culture, their possession of their lands, their possession of their bodies. It was, it was a disaster. The term genocide seems to me really misplaced for relations between the whites and the Indians. That is to say, nobody set out initially to kill off the other in toto. The European initial effort was to get the, Europe, the Indians to work for them. And they would have had, been delighted if they had all survived and all lived. That didn't work because of the disease problem I spoke of. Uh, then when hostilities broke out, and they did, uh, there were cases in which genocide is the right word to describe. One group was completely killed by, by military action. But that was relatively rare. It did happen, but not very commonly. What really killed the Indians was disease. And that's something nobody was aware of, conscious of, or deliberately managing. It just happened. They would not have called it genocide. They did not perceive that they were a cultural group attacking another cultural group. 
they were on God's mission to create uh, the, the, the place where God would return to seek his followers and carry them to heaven. They were, they were uh, willing to do. When, when you have the answers to all the questions that will make mankind happy, it means that if you break a few eggs, you're justified in doing it. And the Spanish were willing to break eggs. The Indians happened to be the eggs. Although the devastation of the Indians is undisputed, why isn't it taught in the history books? Suppose that you guys could write these history books, okay? Suppose you could write these history books. What would you put in there? What would, what, how, would, how would it be different? How would it be any different? Yeah, Ethan. Well, are we talking, how would we rewrite it and keep national stability, or are we talking, how would you rewrite it so it's just perfect? Well, now, wait a second. Uh, that's an interesting question. Is, is, are you getting at the fact that um, if we didn't, we, if the people who wrote the textbooks somehow began telling the truth about Columbus and about what happened to Native Americans, that that would somehow undermine national stability? The same way it would to, to cut down any of the nation's heroes. Well, let me ask you a hard question, Ethan. Do you think that that the, the, uh, the history of a nation as it's taught to the young people should be built on lies? Well, not necessarily lies, but if you tell the better portion of it, then it, then it generates some patriotism. If you're saying that we came in, we killed some people, and so we, we claim this area, that's not exactly going to give people the greatest self-concept. Amanda? Well, I think that a, one way that we could um, teach the truth about Columbus and what he did to the Indians would be to now try to help the Native, to help them, but because we're still discriminating against them and, and shoving them off and, <coughs> and really um, destroying their culture that we want to keep it hidden. Deanna? Uh, I think that um, it has to do a lot with the like Europeans have been in power in America for <laughs> since America, you know, as America started, and if you if pe if it was known that um, at a young age, if children knew that Columbus had come over and invaded and killed all these people who were here before him, and he had been successful in what they were doing, then they'd probably want to know more about Native American culture. And if you started learning more about Native American culture, then you'd see how it was equal, if not better, than. Um, a lot of the things that went on in Europe and a lot of their ideas. America and the world have been greatly enriched by Native American achievements and wisdom. The American concept of democracy owes a great debt to Indian tribal organization. Many of our founding fathers, such as Washington and Franklin, were highly influenced by the League of the Iroquois and adopted some of its essential features in our Constitution. The gold and silver later mined by the Indian slaves in Central and South America allowed European capitalism to expand and fueled the Industrial Revolution. Sixty percent of the food eaten in the world today is of American origin, including corn, tomatoes, peanuts, and potatoes. Indians contributed to the foundation of modern medicine and pharmacology by discovering the curative powers of quinine and a thousand other drugs. Most importantly, Indians were the first true settlers of the Americas, blazing the first paths and constructing villages in the wilderness upon which Europeans later built. Their legacy of living in harmony with nature is sorely needed today as the world grapples with poisoned land air and water. In spite of these contributions, Native Americans still struggle today to preserve their identity as a people. Indians have the shortest lives, lowest income, highest teenage suicide rate, and worst health and living conditions of any group in the United States. Is the oppression of the past still with us today? I think we have to understand that the frontier hasn't ended it has merely moved, and, and the nature of the conflict hasn't ended, it has merely changed. But that the conflict is still there, 
The Indians are still in their communities demanding to be to continue to be Indians. They, they, they want to be Indians. What people in their right mind don't want to be who they are. And, and that's true in the United States and Canada. There's tremendous voice by Indians about their rights. They want the, the right to continue to be. Columbus Day as a symbol of imperialism or oppression seems to me a very lopsided view of the reality. It means you put yourself in the position of the oppressed Indian. They were oppressed, and they did lose their country, lose their territory. But uh, it is also the enlargement of the world, even for the Indians, in terms of knowledge, in terms of uh, technological possibility, in terms of the reality of the society around them. As our society is not closed to the Indians, if the Indians care to enter into it any longer. How can we acknowledge both the Native Americans' experience and Columbus's anniversary? How do you guys think this 500 years, 1492, 1992, should be remembered? How should it be remembered? Think about it for a moment. Big celebrations or what? Uh, Isaac. I think, I think they should get all the... Um, <clears throat> Columbus short stories and all those little things in those little elementary school year, I mean schools, and take them out and write new books and tell the truth because they're just living a lie. I mean, they're thinking of Columbus as a great hero and all that, and just destroy all the books and make new ones. It's a pretty radical idea, Isaac. So the, the, the first, one of the ways that we could uh, commemorate the 500th anniversary would be to start telling the truth? Yeah. <laughs> a good start. Yeah. I think it should be like a Memorial Day for Native Americans. And um, I don't know, maybe like a, a National Awareness Day. I mean, it should be more than a day thing, but like, you know how you have Black History Month. I mean, I think there should be something like that for Native Americans because there are so many different cultures in just this country. There are just so many different cultures of Native Americans that no one knows about. Columbus Day in 1992 raises important questions about the myth and realities of our history and how we see ourselves today. The past cannot be undone, but it can be seen for what it was. The 500th anniversary of Columbus's arrival in the New World is an opportunity, long overdue, to reevaluate the European conquest of the Americas. It is only by broadening our understanding of the past that we can build a more equitable future.